So despite receiving so little sunlight, uh, these, ga these giants experience some very complex uh, weather, including some very powerful storms and some very uh, high-speed winds, particularly in the case of Saturn and Neptune. So what causes all of this? Well, there's essentially two types of causes or two main factors. The first factor we want to talk about is the rapid rotation. That's what gives these uh, winds these very high speeds. And what we have here overlaid on top of the illustrations of these planets are uh, velocity diagrams, uh, particularly the speeds uh, going uh, toward the uh, east, which are you know effectively positive values, and then westward speeds are negative values. So if you take a look at these planets, you'll see that they all have a different arrangement of different speeds. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, Nept uh, Uranus has the strangest one because despite the fact that the equator is drawn in the same direction as the other planets, you got to remember that the, uh, the planet is knocked over on its side at 98 degrees. So these planets are all rotating very rapidly, and as a result, they develop very strong Coriolis forces. Uh, we talked about the Coriolis force uh, a little bit in the uh, in the previous class, and basically you just got to remember that as the planet is rotating, a parcel of air uh, experiences a slight deflection uh, either to the east or to the west, and that's because the planet is rotating underneath that parcel of air as it makes its way north or south. So depending upon where you are in the planet, uh, and uh, the direction that you're moving in, uh, and from where along the planet you're moving, if i.e. the equator, uh, if you're moving very fast, you'll find that your speed is deflected uh, the strongest if you're going from the equator to the north or to the south, and if you're coming from the north or toward the south, and you're heading toward the equator, you'll find that your uh, deflection, your apparent deflection speed is a little bit, a little bit less. In any event. The Coriolis force is the reason why hurricanes on Earth rotate, and this is the reason why the hurricanes and the storms in these giant planets uh, rotate so rapidly. So Jupiter is rotating just about once every 10 hours, for example. Uh, Neptune is once every 16 hours. So uh, the Coriolis forces on Neptune are a little bit less than they are in Jupiter. Nevertheless, uh, you know, 16 hours is a lot faster than what we experience here on Earth. So we're seeing some pretty strong Coriolis forces. Now, the most extreme winds uh, that we know of anywhere in the solar system are to be found in the atmospheres of Neptune and Saturn. I mean, they can reach maximum speeds of 2,000 kilometers per hour. And in fact, Neptune, I think, uh, holds the record for the fastest wind speeds at about 2,100 kilometers per hour. Uh, as you might expect, the speeds are strongest near the equators of the planets. Remember, these planets are all rotating, therefore the parts of the planet that are rotating the fastest are going to be at the equators. That's, of course, where you'd expect to find the uh, fastest winds. On Jupiter, the alternating uh, uh, east-west speeds of these uh, bands, uh, the, yeah, the alternating east-westerly winds, uh, as you can see there in the illustration of Jupiter, uh, the speeds are alternating east to west, east to west, east to west, and so forth. This is why we have these strong banded clouds on Jupiter, and a little bit less so of uh, the reason why we have it on Saturn. It's it's there. It's just that it's a little less uh, a little less pronounced. But uh, this is exactly why we have this. Um, we don't see the same. You know, th this is why we have the strong bands on Jupiter. But Saturn is a slightly different story. Uh, the, as we saw before in the photographs, the uh, bands are not as pronounced. Uh, it's not clear really why these circulation patterns are different from one planet to the next. Uh, so, you know, it's just something that we don't yet fully understand. This is something uh, that we still need to investigate. So we know that the rotation develops the wind, but where is the energy? So we know that let me rephrase that. We know that part of the energy is coming from the energy of motion. But thermal energy is also required to develop these storms. Well, as we, as we saw, the thermal energy rece received from the sun is negligible. It's a puny amount 
compared to what we see here on Earth? Well, it turns out that the heat for the storms is coming from within the planets themselves, uh, at least for Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. Uranus, not so much, uh, but Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune all have significant internal heat. And as we know, heat flows from warm places to cool places. So there's a constant flow of energy from the interiors of these planets outward. Now the flow of heat has a significant effect on global circulation patterns, especially when you have strong convection currents uh, resulting from the heat flows. So uh, remember convection is this idea of just imagine a pot of boiling water uh, a parcel of air uh, is at the bottom of the pot of boiling water. It gets heated by the stove. Warm air rises and a pocket of air forms a bubble. So that bubble rises. Uh, the water uh, surrounding the bubble breaks at the uh, top of the boiling water. The heat is released. The water sinks and it goes and picks up another bubble, carries it up. That is convection uh, in a nutshell. So what's happening is that as this material is or as this uh, thermal energy i should say is being uh pumped up from the planet's interior as that material is, is boiling over if you will into the upper atmosphere uh those convection uh i'm sorry those uh those coriolis forces rather take over and they carry uh they carry that material eastward and westward depending upon where it happens to spill into so you get these you know, convective vortices and these zonal winds uh, helping to give shape uh, to both the bands and the storms. So Jupiter has the most internal heat of all the giant planets. Uh, it's much hotter than it would be uh, if the sunlight were the only source of energy in Jupiter's upper atmosphere. So um, here again, just a few notes just to, just to remind us, uh, you know, Jupiter is packing the most heat you might say. Uh, and when it comes to heat, uh, remember, uh, heat is just a form of, of electromagnetic radiation. It's infrared. And we might remember that the luminosity or the flux or the amount of energy uh, being radiated goes as the temperature to the fourth power. It's a, in other words, a, a tremendous amount of energy uh, can be released for a modest increase in temperature. So if you were to compare the actual temperature of Jupiter compared to what you would expect if Jupiter did not have heat, if it was just relying on sunlight, and you, if you take those two values and you take their ratio and you raise them both to the fourth power, you find that Jupiter is, is putting out uh, more than one and a half times, hundred more than 150% of its energy output. It's actually pumping out more energy than it's taking in from the sun. So Jupiter is effectively its own, is its own heat source. It almost, well, it almost doesn't need the sun. So where is this heat coming from? I mean, how is it that these planets are actually generating their own heat? Well, the answer is gravitational contraction. Uh, that's one of the neat things about these planets being, uh, being made of liquid and gas. Uh, liquid and gas is very susceptible to compression. If they were solid, they wouldn't compress very much. This compression is caused, of course, by their gravitational pull. So the, the planets are, are gradually, very gradually contracting a little bit. Uh, Jupiter contracts at a rate of about two centimeters per year. Uh, it's not very much. Uh, Jupiter's not gonna shrink away anytime soon, but that tiny amount of contraction is enough to raise the temperature just a little bit, giving off a tremendous amount of heat because the energy released goes as the temperature raised to the fourth power. So for a tiny amount of contraction, you get a lot of heat and that's where it's coming from. So let's talk now about uh, the internal structure of these planets. Uh, astronomers have measured the temperature and the pressure only at the outermost layers of these planets. As I said before, you know, we can only look at the upper clouds. Maybe with infrared, we could peer a little bit deeper into some of the cloud layers, but what's under, whatever's underneath it has to be inferred from other observations. And so we develop these models effectively to calculate uh, temperature and pressure from within the planet. 
uh, essentially saying, well, if we can come up with a given model, we should be able to see the following surface temperatures, and we adjust the model until we get something that, that matches our measurement effectively. We fit the model to the measurements. So what we find when we do these calculations is that Jupiter and Saturn, uh, because they have relatively more hydrogen and helium uh, and fewer dense materials than the ice giants, uh, they have these large pressures in the atmosphere. However, the gas is compressed so much under pressure that it actually liquefies at a depth of about a few thousand kilometers. So we've now gone from gaseous hydrogen to liquid hydrogen and sometimes uh, the liquid hydrogen uh, at this very high pressure and this higher temperature it actually can act like a metal so this liquid hydrogen is often referred to as metallic hydrogen i just don't want you to think that we're talking about a solid slab of hydrogen metal we're talking instead about a liquid uh mantle if you will of you know, liquid metallic hydrogen. It's pretty cool. Uh, at even greater depths, the liquid hydrogen in the c can be heated and compressed so much uh, that these the electrons are able to move freely, and now we have this liquid metallic hydrogen uh, as illustrated by the brown color. So we've gone from molecular hydrogen to metallic hydrogen, and then you have the rocky core, uh, maybe a liquid mix of water, rock, metals, things of that nature. So the cores of these planets would naturally be very, very hot, uh, very dense liquids, uh, heavy metals, water, rock, and so on. Uranus and Neptune, however, have more water and volatile materials to begin with. Uh, so they're packing things like methane and ammonia, okay, in addition to water and so forth. And so these volatile materials or ices are compounds of heavy element and that evaporate at very low temperatures. That means that you've got to get to very cold temperatures before uh, these will condense. And that's why we're so far away from the sun. We're receiving uh, much less heat from the sun. Now it's cold enough that we can begin to see uh, a, a strong abundance of these uh, highly volatile materials. So the temperature and pressures inside these ice giants you know, they're not going to be as high as those of the gas giants. Uh, they do not have any kind of a liquid metallic hydrogen, but they do have deep liquid oceans. And in these oceans are where gases and salts could be dissolved, giving rise to an internal structure that is much more ocean-like uh, at uh, relatively uh, modest uh, or relatively modest depths. So where did all this stuff come from? Well, remember, we talked about uh, some likely scenarios for how uh, the giants were formed. <clears throat> we talked about how uh, Jupiter and Saturn were formed from the protoplanetary accretion disk. We had plenty of hydrogen, plenty of helium, still in great abundance back in those days. But then the sun matured and it became a proper star and a massive solar wind blew away all these gases. So Jupiter and Saturn formed first. Uh, there was no Uranus and Neptune at this time. After the solar wind blew and cleared everything out, all of these denser, colder, uh, icy materials were left in the outer fringes of the solar system. And it's believed that that is where uh, Ju uh, Neptune and Uranus came from, but but to be really honest, you know many of the details of this process are not yet fully understood. Um, astronomers are constantly working on more sophisticated models of the early, early solar system, and we're really taking a lot of what we're learning from uh, extrasolar planets. So it's possible that uh, as we learn more about these other solar systems, we can learn more about our own and get some more clues as to uh, why Jupiter and Saturn are the way they are and why the ice giants are the way they are. So these planets are also characterized by some very strong magnetic fields. And you might remember uh, that, uh, you know, whether, well, magnetic fields are generated by the motion of electrically charged particles. So in the gas giants, these materials would 
either be the liquid metallic hydrogen or those oceans that I talked about in the ice giants with the dissolved gases and salts. That's where you're going to find uh, these charged, these electrically charged materials moving around. And so they give rise to some rather interesting magnetic field lines. Um, now, in many ways, the magnetic fields act like a large bar magnet, uh, you know, basically just housed somewhere inside the planet. And, and I want to make sure it's clear we're talking about a, a bar as in like a rod uh, bar type of shape as opposed to a, a horseshoe magnet. Okay, so each each uh, magnet has its own set of poles, a North Pole and a South Pole. Uh, you know, we know on Earth, the North Pole is near the Arctic and the South Pole is in the Antarctic. Um, but on Earth, if you might remember, the magnetic field is not exactly aligned with the rotation axes. Well, that's true of the giant planets as well. As a matter of fact, not only are they not aligned, but they might not even necessarily be anywhere near the rotation axis. Um, if you look at this illustration, you'll find that, uh, you know, here's a bit more detail. Uh, Jupiter's uh, magnetic uh, poles are offset. Saturn's are fairly close to its uh, orbital axis. Uranus is flopped off. Uh, it looks like the bar magnet has uh, shifted away from the axis of rotation entirely. As a matter of fact, consider that the axis of rotation uh, is running from the uh, left to the right, and the uh, north and south pole is not even perpendicular to it. It's, it's, uh, it's completely off. And look at Neptune. Uh, there's this axis of rotation dotted in yellow, and the the bar magnet has completely shifted into some other region of the planet entirely. It's it's just completely different. Why that's the case is not 100% clear. Um, you know, there's a lot of different theories, and again, astronomers are adjusting their models as to how these uh, planets arrived at their magnetic configurations. Uh, but for now, it's enough to simply know that they can be very lopsided. They don't have to correlate uh, with their... Uh, axis of rotation, uh, you know, not unlike what we have here on Earth, but certainly much more extreme. So these planets all feature uh, strong magne magnetospheres. You might remember that uh, these are the outer magnetic fields uh, that extend very, very far out into space. Uh, but the region around the planet in which uh, the magnetic field becomes important to the planet is called the magnetosphere. So the magnetosphere is just a subset or a sub-region of the uh, magnetic field uh, that can affect the planet in some way. Uh, the key thing about these magne magnetospheres is that they interact with the solar wind. I mean, even at these distances, there's still charged particles from the sun being blown out and it carries charged particles. They then get trapped and they spiral down into the magnetic fields, colliding with the outer atmospheres of these planets at their poles. So this, this creates auroras, like we see here on Earth, and I'll show you this in a moment. But just to get you some idea, Jupiter, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, has the largest magnet magnetosphere. Um, remember, magnetic fields are the product of electrically charged particles rotating or moving. Well, Jupiter is moving very fast. It has the most rapid rotation, and it also has the greatest abundance of the stuff. So unsurprisingly, its magnetosphere is huge, and this is kind of what the magnetosphere might look like from Earth if we could somehow see it. And for scale, there is the full moon. Uh, let's widen up the shot a little bit, and uh, if we had a magnetovision, you would see that Jupiter's magnetosphere is a staggering six astronomical units. Uh, it's huge and uh, you know receives a receives a, a tremendous amount of charged particles from the sun just based on its sheer size, despite being so far away. So these charged particles interact with the magnet magnetospheres of Jupiter and Saturn in particular. And we've been able to image those northern and southern lights of Jupiter and Saturn. And by the way, I should point out that uh, you're seeing a composite of two images each for each planet. Uh, the first is a visible light image, so you can actually see the planet. And then ultraviolet uh, observations uh, made with the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, uh, were then used to, uh, were then overlaid at the poles. But 
But really, no kidding, those are the aurorae. We can actually see these aurorae happening as these charged particles spiral down the magnetic field lines and interact uh, with these planets' atmospheres. So uh, with all of that said, I think we are uh, just about done here. I, yeah, we are done. Uh, that concludes uh, this lecture. I apologize for the uh, format in which we had to do it, but if you have any questions, uh, give me a shout, and I uh, will uh, hopefully see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.